Good afternoon, everyone. I am Robbie Uniton, and as president of the Jewish Law Students Association, I would like to take this opportunity to thank those, those responsible for coordinating this event, including Dean Halushka, Audra Foster, Linda Koshman, Larry Start, the SBA, Shari Lesnick, and last but certainly not least, Ms. Connelly. It is both an honor and a privilege to introduce to you our wildly successful and inspirational guest speaker today, Justice Richard Bernstein. Justice Bernstein became the first blind justice elected by voters statewide to the Michigan Supreme Court in November of 2014. With a commitment to fairness and integrity, he began his eight-year term this past January, and on behalf of the student body, we wish him the best. Prior to being elected to Michigan's highest court, Justice Bernstein was known as a diligent advocate for disabled rights as an attorney heading the Public Service Division for the Sam Bernstein Law Firm in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Blind since birth, Justice Bernstein is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate from the University of Michigan and earned his JD from Northwestern University School of Law. Committed to taking action to help clients who needed him, Justice Bernstein's cases often set national standards protecting the rights and safety of people with and without disabilities. Among his cases in private practice, he represented the Paralyzed Veterans of America in partnership with the United States Department of Justice in an action against the University of Michigan to allow for safe access for disabled individuals when the university's alterations to the stadium failed to accommodate disabled visitors. The case has helped establish guidelines that are used by all commercial facilities across the country. As a proponent of education, Justice Bernstein argued for and won preservation of special education funding throughout the state. In conjunction, he filed a federal suit against the ABA to put an end to its discriminatory practices toward blind students via requirements of the law school admissions tests. Uh, previously, he has, he has served on an eight-year term on the Wayne State University Board, Board of Governors, serving as a chair from 2009 to 2010. He also has served as an adjunct professor in the Political Science Department of the University of Michigan. Furthermore, Justice Bernstein has received countless honors of recognition, some of which include, but are not limited to, the Michiganian of the of the year by the Detroit News and has also been named as the, one of Crane's Detroit 40 Under 40. Michigan Lawyers, Lawyers Weekly named Justice Bernstein a 2009 leader in the law and the University of Michigan presented him with the James T. Neubacher Award in 2011 for his unwavering commitment to equal rights and opportunities for the disabled. Aside from his legal accomplishments, Justice Bernstein has completed 18 marathons and multiple Ironman triathlons. In 2013, he was inducted into the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, which is dedicated to honoring Jewish individuals who have distinguished themselves in the world of sports. Justice Bernstein has proven that it does not take sight to have vision. It is in his tenacity to overcome obstacles, turning those obstacles into pathways, and it is on those pathways that he achieves his vision, which contributes to his ad admirable qualities and success as a leader in our community. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Justice Bernstein. We ask ourselves, what role do lawyers play in our community and our society? I am so incredibly grateful to be here on Admitted Students Day. For as you walk through the halls of this beautiful campus and most wondrous of schools, I am undoubtedly knowledge of the fact that as you tell your friends and family that you want to go and become a lawyer, I am absolutely certain the response that you most likely get back is, that's what we need is yet another lawyer. <laughs> and what always makes it more entertaining is how people feel that they are the first people to ever make such a comment to you. <laughs> but the answer to the question, or well, the comment that you should make, is that most certainly we need another lawyer. Most definitely we need another lawyer. We need kind lawyers. We need caring lawyers. We need empathetic lawyers. 
We need understanding lawyers. We need lawyers of passion. We need lawyers of justice. We need lawyers of energy and excitement and enthusiasm for how they can better change their community and allow for us to live in a greater society. For those admitted students who are attending this lunch today, I bid you a welcome to a noble profession, to a profession where you literally singly-handed can change the world that you live in, a profession that you can stand up and fight for what you believe in, a profession that you can help a fellow man or a fellow woman a profession where you can create tremendous and lasting change. People always ask me, I was just at another event where people asked why it was that litigation took so long. And my response was always that change comes in painfully slow, methodical steps. But the greatest change that you could ever find is the change that comes through litigation the change that works through the courts. The political process is balanced by the judiciary, and it is through the power of the judiciary, the order of the court, that life can be enhanced and that life can be made better. So the question that you get asked, which is why is it that we need yet another lawyer? The answer is that you want to partake in a profession that will continue a tradition, that will continue a legacy, and that will allow for you to participate in great, noble, and lasting social change. Law school will be challenging. Law school will be difficult. But I have come to believe that it is our experiences that make us who we are. It is the experiences that we have and that we live by that create the lives that we live, that allow for us to become the people that we are. I always remember awakening at Mount Sinai Hospital, having gone through a traumatic accident and as a spiritual person, I've come to believe that our Creator will always send to us people at just the right time and at just the right moment. For a wonderful man came to my bedside, and he helped for me to realize something significant. He helped me to realize that other than the choice that we as individuals make as it pertains to the power that exists between the forces of good versus evil, that everything else that happens to our life, that everything else that happens to each and every one of us has been inscribed and has been set forth in the great book of life. But the one great power that we as humans have is how do we choose to react to the life that God has chosen for us? How do we choose to react to the life that we have been given? You will come to realize as law students that an easy life does not always correspond to a good one. Often, it is those who know hardship and challenge and difficulty and pain that come to understand and appreciate their purpose, their reason, why they were created. It is through hardship that we come to learn compassion, understanding, warmth, but most importantly, empathy. As lawyers, there's no greater skill set than having the ability to truly relate and connect to the challenges and hardships which are faced by your fellow men and your fellow woman. I remember a story I always share because it goes into the heart of why I do what I do and why I hope that you'll join in this quest. I remember getting a call one day from a wonderful young mother. And she wanted to know why it was 
that she could be such a good and kind and righteous and humble person, but that she would be given a child with special needs, a child with a severe disability. She wants to know why. Why of all people would this happen? Why of all people would she be the one? What kind of a life would her child have? Would he ever have friends? Would he have the chance to go to school? Would he live independently? Would he ever take a wife or get a job? She wanted to know what about her child would be remotely ordinary to that of other children. The question that you're going to ask yourself as law students, the question that you're going to ask yourself as you go through life and why you're doing what you're doing is the question that takes us back to the book of Job. The question that says, why is it that bad things happen to otherwise such good people? Why is it that there are some who walk among us that have to know a greater struggle, a greater hardship, or a greater difficulty than others can possibly know, appreciate, or even begin to understand. And as I spoke with this wonderful young mother, I told her that from this point on, there would be nothing about her life or her family's life that would be even remotely ordinary. For from this day forward, you were sent here to be nothing less than extraordinary. As you go through your classes, as you go through your experiences, why do we need more lawyers? We need more lawyers who will stand up and do what is extraordinary. We need more lawyers who have those challenges and difficulties and hardships that make up their life experience, that make up who they are that make up the challenges that they face, that make up the difficulties that they contend with. We need more people to understand and appreciate those challenges, but who attend schools and who go to class and who do the work so that they can be in a position to do something about it. To not just simply say how unfair, how unjust it is, but to rather be able to say that through my law degree, I have the ability to stand up. I have the ability to make change. I have the ability to advocate. I have the ability to transform. I have the ability to do all these things. Your law degree, your license gives you that chance. It gives you that opportunity. It gives you that ability to do which most people can never do or think can never be done. Yes, as I said before, an easy life does not always correspond to a good one. You have to sometimes believe and as young, aspiring attorneys, you have to believe that you're part of something bigger. You're part of something grander. You're part of something noble. You're part of something meaningful. You have to believe that you're part of a plan that you might not understand, you might not appreciate, you might not comprehend but you're part of something which is bigger and greater than yourself. Now, I've been blessed to have had the opportunity to have completed 18 marathons, and I have been blessed to have had the opportunity to have completed a full Ironman competition. For those of you unfamiliar, an Ironman competition is a 2.4-mile swim followed by a 112-mile bike to be completed by a 26.2-mile run. The rules of <laughs> the rules of the competition are quite simple. If you stop, if you rest, if you take a break, you will be immediately disqualified from the race. You will be immediately disqualified, and two years of work and effort will be for naught. If you finish at 12.01 and not 12 o'clock, it is like you were never even there. 
Law school is analogous to athletics. It is not going to be easy. It is going to be a challenge. It is designed to be that. It is going to be rigorous. It is going to be hard. But I want you to look at law school the way an athlete would train for a marathon or train for an Ironman. I want you to imagine the feeling you would have as you attempt to swim in a frigid body of water. The water temperature of Lake Coeur d'Alene was 55 degrees. As you swam through this frigid water, you would get kicked over and over again in the face by all the other swimmers. You would attempt to surface, but you'd be unable to do so because there'd be other swimmers immediately above you. And ultimately, the rope that connects you to your guide would become ensnared and entangled with that of other swimmers. And the more you struggle, the harder you work, the quicker you get dragged below the surface. The waves come crashing down above you. You try to lift your head up to get air, but you find it difficult, if not impossible, to do so. When you're in school and you're working, and you're doing various other things, there are going to be days in the midst of the winter where you're simply going to say, I can't move forward. There are going to be days where it is so painful and so challenging and so hard that you ask yourself, why? Why? What was I thinking? I can make you a promise from life experience. It's at those moments, it's at those times, that God will always give you what you need when you need it. You won't have anything more, but you'll never have anything less. In my remaining time, I want to share with you two stories that I think emulate the struggles that you're going to face as young aspiring law students and that as young attorneys new attorneys, fresh attorneys, idealistic attorneys, the best type of attorneys. It was a beautiful day in New York Central Park. I was preparing for my 18th marathon and I was walking in the pedestrian lane and as I walked in the pedestrian lane, a bicyclist was going over 35 miles per hour. And since he was going at such a high rate of speed, he ultimately lost control. And in doing so, veered into the pedestrian lane where he struck me directly in the back. A 35 mile hour per, per hour impact is catastrophic. The pain is surreal can't even be described. We ask ourselves during challenges and hardships and difficulties, which you as new students are going to undoubtedly face, why do such things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? And why are there some of us who must face greater hardship and struggle and difficulty than others? Why would you take someone who used athletics to find their voice, to find their identity, to find their strength, and make them have to live in a hospital for over 10 weeks, not be able to do basic things, not have the opportunity to use the bathroom or take a shower, have to have nurses reposition you every five to 10 minutes, you come to realize, as you will realize, as you go through this journey, you celebrate the small things. You celebrate the simple things. People used to come to my bedside and I would ask them, what are you gonna do upon leaving this visit? 
And they would tell me, I'm going to go for dinner, I'm going to go to a restaurant, I'm going to go do dry cleaning, I'm going to go to the grocery store, I'm going to go do all these different kinds of things. And I would tell them, are you going to celebrate that? How does that feel to feel the fresh air? How does that feel to go to the lobby and be amongst other people? How does it feel to ride on the subway or take a taxi? How does that feel to go to a restaurant and have a chance to eat and have the aroma of food all around you? Life, people. As you go through school, you will celebrate the small things. You have to appreciate the totality. You're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. But the question is, can you enjoy the good days enough to survive the bad? Can you have enough good days they will equal to the bad? It's all about the idea that the good has to equal the bad. It's all about the idea that you can look at it in the totality. You have to look at it and understand the journey that you're on. You might have an exam that was difficult. You might have a legal writing assignment that was challenging. You might ask yourself, how do I get through this? It just seems endless. You have to always look at the totality. You have to look at the total of what you're doing and what it means and what it represents. It was interesting. I remember one day the physical therapist and the rehabist came to visit. This will happen to you as you go through your journey. And they said to me, this is unfair. This is unjust. You have a right to be angry. You have a right to be frustrated. You have a right to all of this emotion. But at the end of the day, this is your life. And it's up to you as to how you want to live it and what you want to do with it. Living with pain is going to be challenging. You have to live with an incredible chronic pain. And that pain is going to be with you all the time. You can't live like Rocky where you say, oh, no pain, no pain. You have to learn to accept it. You have to learn to embrace it. And you have to learn to realize that it's going to be a part of you. But it's through that pain that you develop a greater understanding and a greater appreciation of what others face. The more pain, the more understanding. The more pain, the more empathy. The more pain, the more you're able to do with your life. Because you get it. You appreciate it. And you're able to connect with people in a real way, in a significant way, in a most meaningful way. Life can be an extraordinary thing. It was this past year, or a year ago, one year after completing treatment at Mount Sinai, that it was time for the New York City Marathon. This would be my 18th, but my first after a catastrophic injury. It would not be the kind of marathon I used to run. There would be no PRs. Running it on a shattered hip and a crushed pelvis would be difficult to say the absolute least. But there are some times that there are things that just have to be done. Circumstances that just have to be met. And as we ran to the streets of New York, the pain became so severe that I looked to the heavens and I prayed and I said, Hashem, God, give me the chance to finish this. I can deal with the pain, I can work with the pain, but I just need to finish. Sometimes when the pain gets so severe and you choose to ignore it, your body will take it to the next level and your body will attempt to get you to lose consciousness. It will get you to pass out. So I had to fight that, push through that. As we ran at mile 18 up First Avenue, you will have that experience as you go through this school. There will be certain days, but you just don't know if you're going to make it. And I remember realizing something at that point that it is often those who have infirm bodies that have the strongest of souls. 
the most powerful of spirits. The ability to transform, the ability to push forward, the ability to go where you need to go. It will be on those days that you will come to find your peace. Your peace with your new body, your peace with your new circumstance, your peace with your new life. Most importantly, you'll make your peace with God. Why do bad things happen to good people? And why are there some who walk among us that have to know a greater hardship, challenge, and difficulty? You as lawyers will come to know and understand this remarkably well. It is through struggle and pain. It is through adversity and hardship. It is through difficulty that you will come to achieve what is great by doing what is hard. In closing, I challenge you. Look at this experience the way a great writer would approach a novel. As you go through your journey, there must always exist chapters of heartache, pain, difficulty, and suffering for you to come to appreciate, understand, and begin to live the chapters of hope, joy, optimism, triumph. Celebrate your lives. Celebrate your careers. Celebrate the ups. Celebrate the downs. Celebrate the good and celebrate the bad. Celebrate life. Celebrate justice. Celebrate your experiences. The greater the experience, the more help you can render. Celebrate the idea that as you join this of most noble professions, extraordinary things can, will, and must happen for us all.